get rid of the feedback. Whatever. I think this is good enough. I'm not getting any feedback now on my end. Okay, chat, you're going to have to help us out here. Um, can you hear anything? This is the most fucking cockamamie. <laughs> Ridiculous. Growing pains, man. Yeah, that's right. Got to figure this. You might as well use this mess up on me. Right? You're going to have some some massive follower, right? Some person with a massive following someday. And all these kinks are going to be worked out. Okay, they said it's good. And no. uh, <laughs> all right. Yeah, I am going to ask you literally everything again. That's fine. Yeah, no, that's fine. There's a lot more to say there. So, all right. Welcome to the show. Um, we're calling this What Did I Fuck Up This Week? And um, today I'm fucking up an interview about 3D <laughs> printing and guns that uh, I think you're all excited to hear about considering you're even here and you dealt with uh, my uh, half hour of playing audio out of the phone and wondering where it was coming from. Uh, today, we have a special guest, my friend Nicholas. Uh, we've known each other probably, what, junior high? Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's junior high. We grew up together. Uh, Nick is recently moving towards a more anarchist position, he tells me. Um, and before that, we probably didn't share a whole lot of the same views. So, yeah, uh, we've been talking politics a lot more lately, and I wanted him to come on the show because I thought uh, 3D printing and currently what's been going on the past six years with uh, Cody Wilson and guns and things like that that we'll get into later would be a good episode. So, uh, yeah. Um, so why don't you go ahead and give your spiel for the opening that you just did again now that everyone can hear things and yeah, we'll, we'll make things a little better from there. Yeah. Yeah. Which you know, I can kind of clarify around what you said, uh, leaning more towards, um, anarchist thought process or pr principles in my life, right. Or, or how I, I choose to view the world. Um, I've always, I, I've always been a pure capitalist, uh, which drove me always towards a position of, um, you know, I guess you'd call it minarchy, right? Of just minimizing the, the influence of the state on our lives and trying to find um, you know, a happy medium of what they could possibly regulate, uh, but with the ability to have a free, a completely free market, right? So just absolutely no, no nothing around that, no regulations uh, stopping people from from you know entering into a voluntary exchange which is my, my point of view of capitalism. Um, so, you know, I think that's been my position for a long time. Um, but over the last few years, um, it just seems like things get progressively worse um, and it's accelerating very quickly uh, from, from my point of view. Um, and, and not just, not just the, you know, the last couple of years, but, you know, I think, I mean, I hate to even say this, but since 9-11, I think has changed everything uh it's changed the role of government in our lives um you know the relationship that they have with us the things that they do behind our backs uh right uh the, the information that they collect and then lie about uh to uh you know to congress under oath um the wars that we've entered into um you know all of those things have just uh, pushed me further and further down a path to believe that um you know there's there's really no escape from that and that, um, you know, ever encroaching power over time tends to grow and it, and it always does. And I think, uh, you know, there's plenty of people out there that can speak to that. Um, you know, it's, it's the big warning of almost every, every person that talks about power and how it just centralizes more and more and controls more and more over time, um, which actually has nothing to do with uh, my original kind of uh, push towards 3D printing uh, per se. So, um, it was kind of funny. Um, I was, I was trying to find, um, this part for my washing machine 
So I have a, a horizontal washing machine, um, you know, the side okay. side loading, I think, right? Yeah. Um, and like two of the, I think they're called agitators, the, the little wings broke off and there's only three of them. So I only had one and we're in the middle of this pandemic and the supplies from China are, are just crap. I mean, it, it takes forever to get anything. So I ordered this part, I think four or five times from Maytag, trying to get the re just one replacement, anything. And they kept canceling my order, but they wouldn't do it right away. They'd wait like a month, two months, and then they would cancel my order. And the whole time I'm just terrified that like, I mean, what am I gonna do? And it, it, since the ones that were broken, it had like sharp metal where it like would clip into the agitators and it actually like tore up. Like my grandfather gave me this shirt that I love because he gave it to me. And the first time I washed it, it just ripped this hole right in the front of the shirt and just really upset me. <laughs> like, oh my God. Really so what did you have to do for that? Did you have to take one of the other two that were still working and copy it and then print out the third one? It, it just really like kicked out like the thought process that um, nobody nobody knows how bad these supply chain issues can really get. Um, and, and not just with with COVID or you know any of the things that are going on right now with the you know the the war and, and or the, the proxy war, whatever you want to call what whatever's happening right now. Um, you know at some point this is gonna be a valuable skill. And and I think that you know it's it, there's so much flexibility right versatility to 3d printing that you know it just it, it opens up the possibilities for you to take care of yourself right if things break or if you want to create something uh you have this open platform to do that so um i i currently you know i've been doing this for a few months so i'm not an expert um i'm not uh, super deep into this uh but i'm definitely trying to learn more and more about uh you know how to design parts um, you know, from, from scratch and 3d modeling software, um, I printed, you know, a number of, of things, um, and tried to you know, mess around with them and just, just kind of see what the problems are. And, um, it's, it's not something that's terribly difficult, but it's not something that's terribly, um, easy either. Uh, I don't think I had a lot of problems getting my printer set up and things like that. So it takes a little bit of time to, to get an understanding for it and kind of develop it a little bit, I think in, in my mind. Yeah, I've been watching the 3D printing space for actually a really long time because, and and the technology itself is, as far as uh, industrial 3D printing, it's not new. It's pretty old. Yeah. But my big hangup has always been the uh, dealing with the software end of it and 3D graphic design has been something I've fucked around with a little. Yeah. But every time I've tried, it's just been a nightmare to do anything. <laughs> so I figured it would always be sort of uh, a pain in the ass on that end, which probably isn't true anymore. And the other thing is, is the price has come down dramatically. Um, the is. first time I got excited about 3D printing was when the RepRap came out. Have you heard of that? Uh -uh, I haven't. It was one of the first uh, consumer 3D printers that, you know, the idea used to be the, I don't know if they still pitch this anymore, but it was supposed to be like the printer can print a copy of itself. Yeah. And that was supposed to be the big, um, the revolutionary thing about home 3D printing is that, you know, once you have one, you could reproduce the printer itself and then, you know, drop the cost down for all your friends or whoever else you know, if you need more of them or not. And it doesn't look like that actually ever came to fruition as far as I could tell. Yeah, that, that, that was false marketing right there. <laughs> yeah. People, people that don't really understand what, what it is, but trying to latch onto that. And, you know, it's such a problem, I think, with 3D printing is that there's so many barriers that shouldn't be there because it, it's such an awesome thing. I mean, it, it really is. And um, one of my, one of my friends, um, on Twitter, um, he was showing me some things that he had 3d printed and I just, I thought it was so cool. And, you know, I've always been, been interested in it. Um, but he told me that, you know, he spent, 
I think two hundred and forty dollars on his printer, and that yeah. was that was pretty much it. Uh, so and I was like, wow, like you know, where'd you find it? You know, is it still available? And he so he sent me a link to this this site, three um, uh, D Printers Bay is where I got my three D printer, and um, so you know the most popular one that people use. Um, it's, you know, my my opinion, right, is the uh, Creality Ender Ender three. Okay. Um, that, that's definitely you know what, what most people most most hobbyists I should say right it, low low entry point use uh, mine's the version five which just has a couple tweaks to it but basically the the same printer uh, but you know that was only uh, two sixty nine with a little bit of shipping on top of that wow that's yeah that's a lot less than I was thinking entry level would be I was thinking more like four fifty five hundred what's what I do yeah. What would you say is like the state of the art of home 3D printing now? Uh, like what what is the reasonable top of the line? Like if this was a computer comparing, a, you know, a pre-built one to a gaming system, what would be the gaming system of a 3D printer? I don't know you know the exact models, but I can speak to, um, you know, what you'd be able to get out of those, right? And a lot of it comes down to the materials that you're able to work with. Okay. Uh, so some materials, you know, you have to have uh, just higher temperature th thresholds. So, you know, you need to get a different type of tip, uh, different materials used in the actual tip that's just extruding plastic out of it. But the best way to think about a 3D printer, right, is that it's basically just a big hot glue gun that's very accurate. So you yeah. just make little lines and build something up over time, right? So, I mean, they're all very, very precise. And I think, you know, that's, that's the cool thing about these cheap printers that you can, you can do amazing, amazing things with them uh, because these control systems, um, you know, they're just, they're just very, very effective, right? Uh, so when you talk about different, different models and things, right, they have um, like enclosures, you can get on them ventilation. Um, uh, so, you know, you wanna be able to regulate the temperature inside of uh where you're printing so that you get more consistent prints um you know and just better better adhesion to the layers uh as you're putting them together because you're just layering you know very very small uh you know, layers of plastic on top of each other to create this you know, dynamic thing that you're going to make um, so being able to control that environment is very important uh, and some of the older printers um you had to have ventilated systems or have it in an area that was ventilated because uh, the fumes from the plastics that, that were available, or at least that were most common, um, were toxic. So yeah. you know, having it in your living room, as I do, would not be a, not be a good thing, right? Um, but there's some, some materials now, right, where depending on what you're doing, uh, you might want to get a ventilated system uh, just so you can work with some toxic chemical or something that, that does um, you know, it, it, does, it, it doesn't print as easily, right? So um, like most people use what's called a PLA plus, which is coined as the people's plastic by okay. some. Uh, yeah, yeah. That's a great term for it, right? But you know, you get a kilogram of it, kilogram roll, right? It's just a bunch of plastic all rolled up there together. And it's about 20 to $25. That's not bad either. Yeah, you so can print it stuff with that yeah one thing just uh so you know i don't know if you saw this but they just 3d printed a house in my neighborhood in, in your neighborhood yeah wow that's awesome and, yeah i'm gonna be checking that out soon you know it's visually not really i don't think a whole lot of it but it's pretty amazing just to be able to do that i know in i think in china they do that often but hmm. here, I think <clears throat> it's pretty new. I've seen it, like them testing it in developing countries and things like that. Um, I've never really seen commercial use. Uh, it's just not something I'm too familiar with, but that is just super interesting, right? That you could design your own custom home and just print it cell by cell over time. I mean, it's gotta save so much money. And, you know, you can make your own custom house that way pretty easily, right? If you have the right materials and things like that. So. Right. Awesome. Yeah. So what are some of the uh, things you've printed so far? <laughs> Not giving out my address. Oh, the address of the house. 
Let me look at that up. Hold on one sec. I got a couple, a couple of things I got here. The first things I printed were just the, the test files that came with the printer. So I hadn't messed with any of the software yet and things like that. I think it was this little guy right here. I'm going to get a look at that. Yeah, That's just I was trying to see if the printer works, right? Just It's a, just a little figurine. Uh, these were all just the test files that came preloaded. It's a little piggy bank. It's completely useless because it's so small. <laughs> you can put about 50 cents in there, depending on what, what you're doing. Yeah, you'd have to have some really small currency for... Uh... Okay. Um, and then, you know, after that, um, you know, it, took me, it took me about like a week and a half after I got the printer together to get it to actually start printing. I had a lot of problems uh, with, with my printer. Um, and, and not just, you know, typically like everyone has to dial it in. Your, your, you know, your bed that you're printing on has to be perfectly flat. Um, but outside of that, um, the temperature sensors that came with it were broken. Um, it wasn't getting a response from, from, from some of the part, you know, I just had to keep reconnecting things. And then that took me to the point where I had to, uh, buy a voltimeter and I was checking the board to see if there's something wrong, fiddling with just a bunch of crap in there going on forums to try to figure out why the, my, my sensors weren't registering or if they're broken. Uh, so eventually, uh, you know, I got all that straightened out um, and was able to start printing you know, more difficult things. So this, this is like an example of um, like a, a test, a test design. So it, it basically like forces your printer to do things that are a little bit difficult. And I just broke it when I pick it, picked it up. But you can see like these little posts over here, they're all connected to each other at okay. different, different distances from each other. So it's showing you know your ability to to bridge, um, and then this you know perfect kind of perfect arc right that's that's it's concave in there. So you you know you're doing it without any supporting structure under here, trying to build those layers, um, and then you know these different slants at different angles. Oh, interesting. Yeah, so you can just kind of see you know what what kind of definition you're going to get. And then just some letters, and then you see like it looks like a comb there at the bottom. It's focusing on my face, but um, just right here, right, you can see that there's a little bit of lines, maybe. Yeah, I do. Right. I, well, I see it. Yeah. So you know, my first goal is really to try to dial in the printer um, and and start working with it, right? So um, the first things I, I started printing were, were these test files, which was just a recommendation I saw on some YouTube channels. I started following. Right, saying that um, the very first thing that the real thing that I printed uh, was um, an AR-15 lower just to see if I could do it. <laughs> oh, well, we'll definitely get into that in a minute. Yeah. Uh, let's check out that house real quick. I know you can't see what I'm pulling up on the yeah. screen, but I'm going to pop up a browser that. window and just. Uh... So here's an article. Uh, it's Habitat for Humanity Builds Its First 3D Printed Home in the U.S. Uh, Tempe, Arizona, this was June 9th last year. And there you could see the blueprints of it. And that's over, uh, it overlooks a park right by my house called uh, Clark Park. And uh, yeah, you could come shoot me or something if you figure that out. <laughs> um, I'm waiting for it to come up on the stream. There's a, there's a fair delay there. I think the audio delays though too. Maybe... Actually, yeah, I just it's because I hadn't scrolled forward to where we're at. Let me see if I could get a photo of the actual house now because it's done. Uh... I saw, you know, I was looking around at some of this stuff and um, there, I've seen, you know, multiple companies that are uh, 3D printing uh, different organs, possibly. So like, you know, doing research with um, stem cells um, so that you can actually create something, you know, like a, a, a new liver for someone, right? So, I mean, I think there's just, there's so many interesting things um, around that that you can do. Um, I found this guy on Twitter that uh, was asking for volunteers to print prosthetics 
for like children that want to play video games, but maybe you know their hand is messed up, missing parts, or you know they have uh, something that doesn't allow them to grasp the controller in a normal way. Um, and so he creates special prosthesis for these 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 kids. Um, and so if you know you're relatively close to where that kid might be, um, he'll just send the print files to you, and you print them and ship them to the kid's address. And if they need new ones, you just kind of recycle them and send them a, you know an updated version of it. I thought it was pretty interesting. Yeah, I did. I saw something about that too. I'm not finding the photo I want, but um, <laughs> there's a bunch of bunch of stuff I pulled up. Anyone could look this up, though. It's pretty widely reported on. So yeah, uh, homes, organs, um, all sorts of stuff can be 3D printed. I want to, I know we're going to be moving into, you know, a more dicey topic in a second. And I want to segue into that with an article um, that came up recently. But before I get into that, because I know that's sort of like the highlight of what we're going to be talking about. Uh, what do you think, yeah, this is the concrete 3D house responding to the chat. So I know me and you come from fairly different economic angles. Uh, and I'm curious about where 3D printing fits into your model economy. Cause I know for me, uh, my model economy is really a DIY sort of communal living thing and i think it's pretty straightforward that if a community has access to 3d printing technology that's going to you know permit collective use for whatever but um yeah i'm interested in what the market angle is yeah uh yeah, I can, you know, there's plenty of people out there that design parts and sell them in a capitalist environment right so um I think that it just gives it, it diversifies, you know, the access, uh, which you know, if you have more competition in, in any type of industry, it's going to you know spur innovation, uh, different products that will come out, um, and just better designs. Um, you know, I really believe that, you know, it's still in its infancy with the technology that we have available. You know, there's there's interesting things out there like uh, you know 3D scanners where you can automatically basically import the shape of, of an object just based on scanning it or scanning around it, right? Um, they're very expensive, uh, but that will definitely come down. I mean, I don't see a problem or a reason why, uh, you know, you wouldn't be able to use that, do that on your phone someday. And that, that alone will open up this whole world to so many people, right? Just, just to be able to have that kind of access and making the software easier to work with so that people can do it. Now, right now, it, it's based so much on, you know, manufacturing principles, um, and, and I think kind of you know the way that they they come at designing software um, that makes it you know, such a high barrier for entry for normal people like you and me to really get started. And believe me, um, all the troubles that you were talking about, I am trying to live through and persist through, and it's painful. <laughs> yeah, and you know that's like a big you know a lot of the technology we use today uh that's not open source and free um the reason why is really that the barriers to being on the back end of it are so high like the technology that creates facebook or the technology that creates you know other kinds of social media platforms it's not uh at the end of the day it's free and open source but companies are able to bridge that gap and get, you know, moms and grandmas and granddads and toddlers <laughs> using it. And so that's how they build up their audience. And yeah, I do see that same pattern is probably going to happen with 3D printing as well. Yeah, um, I, hope, yeah I really do. <clears throat> Have you seen the, the new Ray-Bans that came out for Facebook, Meta? Uh, is that AR? Are they AR Ray-Bans, like augmented reality? I don't know if they actually have augmented, like, I don't think it's like Google, Google Glass. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think that they just, um, I could be wrong about this. I, I, I just block it. 
every time I see an ad for them come up. You bastards. <laughs> no, I, I haven't seen it. About wearing this GPS that's videotaping everything that I do all the time and has access to the internet. Like, that is such a bad idea. Like, I've already, I have a, I have a, an Apple Watch that I bought like a couple years ago. I mean, it's, it, uh, it's been dead for, uh, it's been sitting here dead for I don't even know how long. Uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm definitely not. I just, it, it's just so funny to me that people want to jump on that as quickly as possible. Sorry, segue there. <laughs> oh yeah, well the yeah, nobody. For the most part, people just do not give a shit about privacy. Obviously. And, yeah, right. I mean, you know, we, I mean, we live in a culture where a lot of the goal is to become famous in one way or another. So. You kind of have a competing goal there if you want to also have a ton of privacy which okay. firsthand i i'm struggling with that divide and uh trying to gain viewers and an audience and also want to maintain privacy and it's like you can't do both at some point right? yeah it just it just breaks and there, there's always a price to pay for for these things right mm -hmm. i have to say like you know with the the 3d printing community one thing i really appreciate as I've like, learned more about it, is that um, people are, one, they're really nice I, for whatever reason, and that's a massive generalization, um, but all the people I've reached out to for help or questions, uh, trying to print things or having, having problems, they've all been so helpful, and there's so much free content. I, I, I sent you that link earlier, right? Just right. going yeah, through things. You, you can see, right? I mean, Yes, like I am a diehard capitalist. That is what I believe in. But if I if I made something and I really wanted people to have it because I believed in something, it it changes right. The the, the cost of me doing that is okay because it's more valuable to me that people have access to it. And you know, I think that drives a lot of the community is just building on itself to to do this. Um, well, yeah, and it's not like open source stuff isn't used privately anyway. I mean, the two aren't necessarily opposed to each other. No, I think that, you know, obviously I would like them to be, but uh, yeah. Um, we can save that one. Something's for free, it's free for everybody, right? So that doesn't mean you can't make money off of it. I think it, it's really interesting that, you know, the reason why a lot of... Um, let's say the the more troublesome uh, designs that are available on the internet uh, you know those are only legal because of uh, the first amendment because it is regulated as speech oh yeah, right yeah so okay let's so let's get into it all right I'm gonna pull up the article <laughs> and then we'll we'll start talking about uh, the most controversial aspect of 3d printing so i sent you the link er earlier i don't know if you got a chance to check it out um, yeah, i browsed over it if you want to kind of go through it really quickly that'll be good yeah so i got it up on the screen right now and uh this is a story um published from it's going down who are mostly like direct action oriented leftists it's a lot of it's anarchist but uh they're not strict on that Anyway, so this is about how an undercover Colorado Springs police officer tried to entrap leftists with illegal firearms charges. And this isn't related to 3D printing necessarily, but it does speak to um, some of the, uh, uh, I guess, legal controversy and government tactics that surround guns and um, the intersection of guns and activists. And part of what the article describes is the emphasis that police agencies have on trying to target activists who are specifically knowledgeable and um, uh, interested in guns. Right. And I believe that would be both on the right and the left. Yep. So it's a, uh, yeah, I thought it was a good article. It goes into the stories about just how, like, how deeply embedded agents can make themselves in different groups and 
the extent to which agents will go to try to convince um, more or less naive gun owners or um, activists who are public in showing their arms or organizing militias or any kind of armed group, uh, what extent they'll go to try to get them to do something illegal, specifically surrounding guns. And it's scary because, you know, it's the first thing that came to my mind when I wanted to do this episode was like, this is clearly one of those things that is going to potentially put a target on me. And so I want to talk about it in the way that um, is is going to be less risky. <laughs> <laughs> there is only more or less. Uh, and I was wondering, yeah, so what was your takeaway from it? Because I just, I, I've been fairly well exposed to uh, what federal agents and informants and whatnot have done over the past 10 to 20 years in anarchist communities. Uh, so this isn't really different to me in that regard, but uh, the fact that their their axis of uh, who they're targeting is around guns now more than it is around, like, let's say, animal liberation yep. or eco eco activism uh, that I thought was newsworthy. What, what about you? What are your thoughts? Uh, I, I think that this is, you know, target number one, to be honest. I mean, if I had to, if I had to think of something except for, you know, actually people that are violent. Uh, but, um, yeah, I've seen multiple of those leaders in this movement, you know, getting raided by the ATF with, you know, perceivably they've done nothing wrong. Uh, but they go in looking for something uh, that, 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 that they may have done wrong. Um, granted, I don't know that, right? But when you see multiple people that talk about this all the time, uh, hey, guys, don't do something stupid because they're watching us. And hey, look at all these messages I have in my, my direct messages saying, hey, can you print me an auto sear, which makes a gun automatic, basically. If you want a fully automatic gun, you could print a part and drop it into your gun. So, you know, there's, there's so many times that these people have taken screenshots and said, oh, here's a brand new account with some uh, young girl asking if that, if I can print them this device to put in their gun or, uh, hey, you know, can you 3D print a lower for me and I'll just pay you for it. Or right. we'll, do a, we'll do a trade, which is completely illegal. And anyone that is smart enough to design a 3d printed gun is, is hopefully way too smart to fall for a trap like that unless it is someone that's so embedded uh that they make a mistake right they 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 think it's their friend they think it's someone that they care about or you know and i think we both agree that um people can twist their words in mm -hmm. an affidavit right so you have the arresting officer the embedded officer that um can say hey yeah he sold me this and not the five other things that were around that cr that created that event to actually happen, right? It's it's the transaction, and that's how they're prosecuted. Not all of the subcontext and misleading things that led up to that that really might change someone's view of how that actually took place. You know, it, it's 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 terrible. It it, it really is. Um, which is another reason why I feel like it's really important to talk about it. Yeah, so, exactly. And in this case in particular, I mean, uh, fortunately, it didn't lead to any arrests and the agent was outed. But yeah. what the agent did is they relied on, they created a persona of someone who would be thought of as extremely vulnerable as a sex worker that really would need uh, some sort of protection that for one reason or another, they weren't able to get uh, through legal means. And they use this on a couple different people that the article goes into to try to convince them to, yeah, basically to sell them uh, an illegal weapon. That's pretty terrible. I mean, yeah, can't even imagine how despicable that is. It, that that's okay. It, it's like you know, on the on the ATF's Twitter. Um, I don't know if you saw this on um, on Valentine's Day. 
they posted uh, basically like, hey, are you mad at your ex? Did they sell any illegal firearms? Call oh us right God. now and we'll go pick them up and have like big hearts and all this, you know, teddy bear on it and crap. I mean, just just crazy. These people are just demented. It, it's It's incredible. It really is. And that, like I said, that's really why I want to talk about it so that I think there's such a stigma around 3D printing and especially 3D printing guns. But yes. it's the same as buying a gun. It's just I did it in my house. You know, I, I am I am a gun manufacturer. Um, it's an art. You can create something from nothing that fits you. I think there's a lot of value to that um, outside of, you know, uh, however you feel about the government or future state of the world, which is a whole other topic uh, to kind right. of talk about around that, right? Yeah. And just before we dive into the 3D printing part, I mean, my background with guns in general is my parents are from uh, inner city Chicago. So I grew up with the uh, the idea about guns being that if somebody had a gun, they're basically in, in the mafia or they were involved in some sort of crime. So no one had guns in my family. Um, and I was raised with that view. Obviously, growing up in Arizona, though, that is not uh, that is not the <laughs> the perspective of I would say most people. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I have very little exposure to guns. I've never had one. I've shot maybe twice. Do you know what you shot? Do you no, remember? I mean some kind of rifle hunting with okay. a friend, and yeah, like not not <laughs> yeah. I think I shot a some sort of handgun once, but some sort of handgun. Right. Yeah. Exactly. I don't even know what caliber. I mean, you know, my gun knowledge is like I know there's different bullets, and <laughs> that, that, that makes <laughs> that uh, you know, you need a different gun for a different bullet, and it depends. <laughs> that that uh, yeah, yeah. That's pretty much it. Yeah. I've heard there's it. something called rifling where it yeah. makes bullets spin. It spins you know, it. It spins yeah. the bullet. It was a huge breakthrough, you know, over a hundred years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> There's uh, accuracy improvement. I heard with the spinning, it's like the football. I think the first time that I shot a gun, I was probably five or six years old. Oh wow! Pro probably six. It could have been earlier in my life, um, but I, I think I think that was the first time. Um, I I was I was born in California. Um, outside of LA, um, San Bernardino is where I grew up, which is a very, very dangerous city. Um, they're usually in the top 10 for per capita murder rate in the United States for the last 15 years. Um, and my uh, my grandfather, he always wanted to live on a farm, and he grew up uh, in Oklahoma with his family when he was when he was a kid, and he always wanted to get back there, and that's where his mom was at, and, a lot, and his his sisters and all that, and so. Um, he just kind of said, hey, I'm going to do this. And if you guys want to come with me, come with me. And so my mom and my sister and I, we moved out there and we lived on this farm and raised, raised beef cattle. Right. I mean, we raised, raised cows to be slaughtered. You know, before I went to school every day, I was out feeding the cows, working the cows. Um, I, I have I have literally held on to bull testicles while my grandfather slashed them off with a razor blade and just. I mean, scarring memories of my life. Uh, it was it was very different uh, from from California. Um, but yeah. but he lived on a couple thousand acres. Okay. His, wow. His, his driveway was two and a half miles long. Um, there was a lake on his property, multiple ponds. And the implication uh, there is is that that's enough land where you could shoot a gun and not worry about it, right? Yes, you can do whatever you want. And well, we did, you know, I mean, if you, if you literally want to just ride a horse in the woods for, you know, the next three hours with a gun on your back at seven or eight years old, you could just go do that. And no one would really even question what you were doing, right? I mean, it's just me and my uncle who was a few years older than me and, and my sister. Uh, who's the same age as him, right? So three three years separation. I was the little little kid, the little shit, uh, seven year old, just tagging along with the older kids that were ten or eleven years old, doing all this stuff, right? Um, usually, I'd have a twenty two on my back, and uh, my my little eighty motorcycle, and we just would go stay out in the middle of nowhere, right? Just camp out all the time. 
So it was just it was a really different way to way to grow up. So you know, I'm just I I have the ability to shoot. I mean, dozens and dozens of different different guns. You know, everything from uh, you know, shotguns, small handguns, to a Mac 10 little submachine gun, like an Uzi. I guess would be easy oh, yeah. to bridge the gap there, right? I've seen um, them, yeah, in yeah. games, in video games. <laughs> I was just a little kid, like, oh my god, it wasn't automatic or anything like that. But uh, no, it, it just it, it really opened it up. But you know, they're also very, very keen on being safe. Uh, yeah, and really learning how to uh, how to how to how to respect it, and that's the important thing. And and you know, one thing I'm really thankful for is, you know, getting such a, a deep understanding of it because I've taken so many of my friends shooting for their first time or my coworkers over the years. Um, and I really try to work on the ones that don't want to. Oh, yeah. They usually love it. And that's That's been my experience. Um, if you can get them to just shoot the gun one time, the just electricity on their face is incredible. I don't know. It, it's super funny. Which I also learned, you don't ever give uh, give them more than one bullet, because they'll get excited and they'll squeeze the trigger again. <laughs> uh, so the first time, and yeah, if you're not with me, just trust me, is it, it's overwhelming. Your first time, it's it can be shocking. I think um, uh, just depending on your personality and what your expectation is. Uh, so just use one bullet is my recommendation until you get a little bit used to it, and then put some more in there after you're a little bit more comfortable with it. But, well, that's yeah, good very, advice. very different from your background though yeah so, yeah uh and that's not to say i didn't grow up you know carrying knives around and blowing <laughs> shit up and you know, every it's like everything else but guns it's also right. a cost you know i was pretty broke for most of my life so I, buying a gun would have been just like i'd be deciding between that and like a six pack of beer every, you know a few <laughs> six packs <laughs> um maybe a car payment though right or okay. not really yeah. like literally anything that i would need uh yeah. would come before buying a gun or a number of anything else really so yeah, that's yeah. another reason i never got into it as an adult is just i never there's just so many other priorities uh, yeah. but uh so what would you say about gun regulation now is it do you, would you say it's increased uh decreased or is it about the same as when you were growing up it always goes in the same direction and it's it, it never becomes more open um right i mean during trump we had the bump stock ban after the vegas shooting mm -hmm. you know i mean he signed that he was so happy and and he was pushing to sign that the entire time um right now the atf is on the verge uh, and go ahead, look that up. Correct me if I'm wrong about that. Uh, but I believe that uh, that all came out of the Vegas shooting, uh, if I remember correctly. But um, the ATF is talking about um, a point system that will completely change the way that you can build, especially like, um, I want to say, short barrel rifle. Just uh, if you want to have something that's really compact. Um, you know, there's a lot of regulations around like the length of your barrel, what kind of uh, stock or brace that you can actually uh, put on the weapon. Um, and you have to go through different registrations depending on uh, what those things look like. Like if your barrel is this short uh, and you have this type of stock, then you have to register it and give a tax stamp and um, all, all of these things, right? Um, the ATF is is talking, I mean, any any day now they can come out with this regulation that no one voted for, no one wanted, they can just push this through, uh, just like just like you know, the the vaccine mandates to be employed through some agency, no one ever voted for it. And right. the only right. way that it can get struck down is by the Supreme Court. Yeah, uh, and I, just in general, it seems like uh, you know, in, in anarchist discourse or just really politics in general, I don't think there's a very clear understanding of just how how departmentalized the state is as far as the authority it gives to these different departments to somewhat autonomously make decisions. Like, I'm actually going to pull up a picture I, I like looking at every now and then. I'll, uh, just uh, what what the, the government looks like. Right. You know, there, there's there's almost no 
ability to track, or they don't even know how many federal regulations exist on the books, but the number of, of regulations that come out of these other entities is an order of magnitude beyond what has been passed by Congress over the years. I just, yeah, it, it's incredible. It, it really is. And, you know, you can have any president come in or, or Congress just create some agency out of, out of thin air that can basically have autonomy over this whole sector of your life and with really broad reaching impacts, right? That might not even be in their, their purview. I'm going to assume that that has something to do with your picture I'm waiting for. Are you scrolling? Yeah, you know, uh, I'm getting a weird error. Looks like you're apparently DuckDuckGo is having a problem with their image uh, stuff right now. But yeah, if you just look at a, a chart like this, I mean, you see the way that the government breaks down to all these different departments. Just it's massive and it's uh the checks and balances on the different departments are way less than people would assume they are anyway that's sort of a, a side note but the reason i'm i'm bringing all this up uh is because you know there's a lot of investment bias right built into um the way people are responding to the 3D printed gun, where there's been however many decades of regulation, however many departments and tax dollars and everything else that's gone into building up this enormous infrastructure that's daily rating and regulating and controlling the, uh, the public's ownership and use of firearms that uh, that's not going to ever budge. And so that uh, brings the question up is what does 3D printing guns mean uh, given that situation? Have you, have you been following what's going on in uh, Myanmar at all? You know, uh, no, I haven't. And I know it's a big issue. I so, know Facebook has been getting um, into some shit because of it. Hmm. Yeah, no, yeah, I heard a little, a little bit about it. I don't know too much about that, but that they were allowing, I think, uh, the military to cause some real problem, people dying basically because of what they were, what people were propagating on some platforms. Um, but yeah, I'm, I, I don't know everything about that, so I won't speak to it too much. Uh, but what I can say is that, uh, right? So my understanding is that you know there was a, an election, you know, the results were contested whether that, that's viable or not. The military basically came in and performed a coup. It took over the government and then started going around the country uh, to places where there was dissent um, and people were dying. Um, you know, at least that, that's what you know, one of the sides is saying and they're posting these pictures showing uh, people getting buried outside the cities that were participating in protests against the, this new uh, military regime, things mm -hmm. like that. Right? So there's there's all these problems, and they have no way to defend themselves at all. Um, there was this guy posting on Reddit for a number of months, asking questions about um, the this this platform. It's called the FGC9. So fuck gun control nine. Oh, okay. <laughs> Uh, so I, I, I kind of mentioned to you this before um, about uh, Jay Stark, who uh, is this guy from, uh, I believe it was Germany or Austria, I can't remember exactly right now, but he was in this great Vice documentary uh, not too long ago, uh, where he you know, brought Vice in, did a whole interview with him, uh, went out into the middle of the woods, middle of nowhere, and shot his uh, FGC9 on this, you know, on, on this thing. Um, he, was, he was raided shortly thereafter. Um, you know, only a few months, I think, after that that documentary was shot or at least published, um, and for whatever reason, um, he died. I think two or three days after um, that police raid took place, he had a heart attack um, in his mid 30s. He was he was younger than the two of us. Hmm. Okay. Um, no known issues and whatnot, but uh, he did just mysteriously die uh, a few days after that encounter. So uh, leave that for what it is. But uh, Jay Stark is a legend. Um, 
if you look in forums, do you watch any of these these videos and things? Um, you know, people are always doing homage to Jay Stark and and what he's given to the community, because he created this whole FGC9 platform that basically you can create a fully functional rifle um, in your garage. Uh, for you know, it's inexpensive. Uh, he shows you how to do everything, literally in step-by-step -step instructions with things that you can mostly buy from Home Depot. So we're not saying like you know typical 3D printing where you're just printing the you know plastic composite base to get around a, a stamp. We're saying that you 3D print the lower part, the upper part. You buy a tube of metal, and he shows you how to rifle the barrel. Yeah. Sorry. That to Rifling, yeah. I'm not making fun of you. I'm not making a <laughs> promise. But but literally, I mean, there's there's step by step instructions on how to create the correct twist, which gives you the correct spin on the velocity of the bullet that you want to get it, make it the most accurate, right? And all the little springs you have to buy. So you, you know, there's one spring that that you have to chop in half or you know measure it exactly right, and it goes in this spot, right? So you you have to do these little tweaks to get it to work, right? Uh, but him and, and mostly American collaborators created this entire FGC platform. Uh, so going back to Myanmar, um, this guy had been posting on the Reddit forums uh, for that community, asking some very specific questions about, well, what about range and how do you do this? And hey, I'm having a little bit of trouble with, with this. Um, and then one day, um, the military side, the, you know, the, the, the regime, uh, started posting pictures of guns that they found. And those guns were FGC nines. And that guy in Reddit came out and said, Hey, I mean, they know what we're doing. So I might as well tell everybody, uh, you know, I am with the Myanmar, um, revolution or whatever you want to call those people, right? Uh, the people standing up against this regime. Uh, thank you so much because we are manufacturing your rifles. Uh, trying to produce as many as we can to arm civilians to protect. Wow. Protect ourselves. That's, yeah, I have not heard about that side of the Myanmar issue, you know, for as little as I've been following it. But the other fig, there is another figure besides Jay Stark, you said. Uh -huh. Yeah, this other guy, Cody Wilson, who I've been following for a while, who you know, in a lot of ways, it's been a disappointment to me because he's gotten involved, you know, one of his projects was called Hatreon, which was like an alternative Patreon platform uh, that was quite friendly, if not encouraging, you know, neo-Nazis and their ilk to, uh, you know, be able to fund their media projects or whatever they're doing. But when he first came into my awareness, he was, I think, just out of college and just beginning to use 3D printing to design uh, ghost guns, yep. is what they're called. And he described himself as a crypto anarchist, and uh, but also as an anarchist in general and seemed very well informed by some of the philosophers I like. Uh, Foucault, for instance, is a big influence on him. And for a while there, I thought this was going to be a really interesting uh, um, break in uh, the way people think about politics, because you had, to me, in my opinion, this was like the right person who could say the right things and could also act on them and create something out of it that would physically disrupt the, the status quo. And... You know, despite how he's turned out, uh, and I don't know where he is politically, to be honest. I don't think he even knows where he is. The last interview I watched with him, he hmm. seems to go back and forth on different uh, different stances on political economy, for lack of a better word. Hmm. But... Um, yeah, I since the ghost gun, I know that he's worked on uh, i think the a lower end receiver thing yeah and so he's uh he's basically um you, you can go online and you can buy a gun a ghost gun that has no uh, serial numbers on it as long as it isn't manufactured more than 80 percent 
Okay. It's just a, it's just a number. Well, and I think it was called the Liberator was his, the gun that he made. Yeah, yeah. Th that was the pure 3D printed uh, one shot gun. I think yep. yeah, I've seen that. Yeah, it's, it's ridiculous, but you can fully 3D print it. So it's, it's pretty cool and it won't blow up on you if you, if you do it properly. Um, but uh, what, what he's doing now, uh, because, you know, we have these laws that could come out around 3D printing, uh, you know, something or uh, using these 80 percent finished product to mm -hmm. basically all you have to do it. You, you buy a jig, you line up the jig and then drill the correct where the holes are at. Small modifications. Anyone can do it. And you're given basically everything you need except the drill and some of and then you just use a parts kit and put it together. But, you know, it's very well possible that that could be outlawed any second. Right. Just ATF can can try to create a, a stop to that. They, they would have a problem trying to jump to that extreme. Uh, but yeah, there's you know, a, Congress... It's logistically like a nightmare to try to figure out what to, you could even do about that. It, it is, but they will. Yeah, right? that's all I can say. We all know that they will. Uh, but what Cody did, which is amazing, is that he basically created an at home CNC device. So you can mill your own receiver, your own lower part of the gun that has to be stamped, like what I was, would be 3D printing at home, you can take a block of aluminum, put it in this machine, and then you get an AR-15 lower out of it. So wow. I mean, how do you regulate that when you're doing it from a block of metal? No, right? and he's been through multiple court proceedings and they find, you know, they drop the case or whatever. I don't know what the results have been, but basically he's been Fine. The other controversial thing is he had some like underage, yeah, it's all that. whatever oh, all that statutory mm -hmm. rape or something like that. Which, I mean, I'm not a, I, I don't know. That's not has nothing to do with guns. So, doesn't. Yeah, I, I don't um, know about it to even speak about it to be honest with you. He, but yeah, he's talked about it during interviews, and yeah. it sounds like it was like something he's open about and admits to and you know he's dealt with the charges and did whatever he, whatever he had to do so um how does he interface with what you were talking about the f the fuck control fuck fuck gun gun control yeah fuck is he part control. of that or is that separate project from him or I, I honestly don't know if he is connected uh you know more about cody uh than i do and really what i've been super interested in what he's doing which uh he's down in austin so he's he's three hours from me um you know I, i'd be super interested uh he last i saw he was shipping um 55 what does it say 55 lowers a week out wow. of his facility which is just crazy i'm not sure exactly what that is because that that should be there should be a legal issue there if he's actually pr doing the entire build but if he's doing 80 percent, so then maybe that's what they were talking about but uh you know he's been really focused around uh this cnc milling uh because it absolutely destroys um any ability to regulate um you know that 80 percent uh sale or or maybe even 3d printing which is maybe similar actually because you're doing it from nothing I guess there's there's a similarity there, but obviously, I mean, it's metal. It's it, you're doing it out of out of aluminum, and it will literally last forever and be super high quality. And I don't even think that the machines are very expensive. Maybe a few thousand dollars. Yeah. I don't know much, but yeah. So that's all really interesting, and obviously, the big question anybody asks him uh, when he does an interview is, okay, so what about the effects on kids? You know what how do you feel if your guns are used for crime this and that which i always think these are stupid questions or they're at least questions <laughs> that you could ask any gun manufacturer whatsoever yeah and i just don't think these kind of problems are within the design uh and production ethics although I, well i don't know is it, it sort of like is it do we blame Einstein for the atom bomb or do we blame Washington for dropping it on Hiroshima? Like, I think there's a, I don't think you, you know, I'm not one of these people who believes that you can manufacture a good society um, through technology. I don't, I really don't think you could like create the right incentives or 
like build good behavior into a system. I think yeah. people are pretty, if anything, they're pretty irrational and unpredictable in as individuals, as groups, that's a different story. But I, I think that people are very rational, uh, but that doesn't mean that that's what you would choose. I think that, you know, they just might have different influences, different incentives that drive them towards something. Right? It may appear irrational, but for that right. person, it's perfectly rational. I, yeah, I think I'm not necessarily saying that it's like a, the capacity of the person. I mean, like if you're going to design a system from, even if you use AI, I don't think you're going to be able to, to emulate uh, your user's behavior to an extent to where you could like prevent the wrong person from getting the gun or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, or like make sure only like people in pain get uh painkillers or like any like anything or like you know kids who are smart get into the smart classes or i don't think these are things that systems can really do yeah no i, I agree with you uh, mostly because uh in every system uh there's a hierarchy of power which just means you know by its own design, it, it has to fail uh, because power will centralize and people in power will get will be incentivized to do the things that they want to get yeah. around that system. They'll create a system that allows them to escape it, which is the definition of our government, in, in my opinion. There's that and there's a feedback problem because the difference between the social sciences and the material sciences or natural sciences is that you know, when you put out a study in the social sciences that has an impact on the thing you're studying. Whereas if you put out a paper in physics, molecules don't start behaving differently. You know, you put out something in chemistry, you know, it's not like Coca-Cola has to change its recipe. But in the social sciences, if you put out a, if you do polling or you put out a prediction about how the stock market's gonna behave yeah. or you highlight, you know, some, lesson that you think is important from history that's gonna you know if it's impacting people it's going to change their behavior so there's a feedback problem where when you try to create social systems the system itself is changing the behavior it's trying to regulate yeah but which you know i think that 3d printing and uh the community the the sharing of knowledge um all of that is because of uh the direct impact of regulations, fear of regulations, um, the encroachment of power, especially by the executive branch of our government. Uh, I think all of those things have uh, created uh, you know, this environment that's really around 3D printing that's extremely positive, that's extremely open to share. Uh, so, you know, in, in my in my perspective, right, when we talk about, you know, how does 3D printing um, associate with capitalism, the cost, if we do not do this, is extremely high. Because, you know, I, I believe that the safest way to protect humanity, protect ourselves, protect the world, and, and someday have, you know, what you and I both share in, in believing that people should be able to, to freely move, freely associate, and uh, you know, freely exchange their ideas with one another and, and share in a community that they choose to be a part of. Whatever that might be, you should be free to choose that. Yeah, um, and I don't think there's a, a non-authoritarian way to think about that otherwise. I mean, Self-defense in general, you know, the second you hand that over to a, an institution, you're creating, uh, you're giving up something pretty fundamental to what it means to be free and exactly. yeah <clears throat> um yeah so yeah the atf and everything what you're saying basically it's like the streisand effect right can you define that i've heard that so many times and I actually i was gonna google it and i honestly don't even know what it is we I've might as well google that but i'm pretty <laughs> sure it's when Be barbara streisand was uh the controversy around her created uh, and increased her popularity. Yeah. Okay, well, that makes sense. Uh, I'll, I'll give you a, a quote. I, I'm not going to do this perfectly, um, and I don't remember his name either. Um, uh, but uh, during World War II, 
um, I don't, I can't remember if it was the the emperor of Japan or um, the person, you know, it was Yamamoto, Yamamoto that was reading, leading their Navy, but they were talking about a land invasion in the United States. And uh, he commented that uh, there would be a gun behind every blade of grass. That was his way of saying we should not do this. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah, it's uh, it seems to be a pretty universal uh, response to regulation. Yeah. So anyway, yeah, the Wikipedia, the Streisand effect is a phenomenon that occurs when an attempt to hide, remove, or censor information has the un unintended consequence of increasing awareness of that information. So. Makes sense. So now you know, you know, you know, a new uh, <laughs> idiom or whatever you would. I'm going to put it, I'm gonna, it'll be my, my phrase of the day tomorrow. And I'll do a Pee Wee Herman for you. What, what's a Pee Wee Herman? Oh. <laughs> you remember that? Come on, man. Oh, it's been a while. It's been a while. It's been a while. But no, did, did you get that quote, though, that you know, he said, uh, if we invade America, there would be a gun behind every blade of grass. Yeah, you know, yeah. His way of deterring away from it, right? Yes. Okay. When your response, I thought you were taking it a different way because I know you were going to the video and whatnot. Oh um, no, no, no! I just uh, I didn't respond to it. Is I was still lagging behind. <laughs> yeah, no um. Yeah. Well, the whole th there's actually a really good book that came out a few years ago called um, "How to Hide an Empire," hmm. and the book begins talking about how we all started calling Pearl Harbor, Pearl Harbor. And just like the, the public relations um, effort that went into taking Japan's, uh, uh, what was it, Guam and some of the other territories were invaded and uh, Hawaii, I think. Was, they just bombed Hawaii. They didn't invade it. They, they bombed Hawaii, this is, but this is Pearl Harbor. But yeah. there is a whole PR back and forth between the president, Midway, trying to, fig trying to figure out what to say, how to describe the situation to the American people. And originally, they didn't call it Pearl Harbor, mm -hmm. um, but they decided to start calling it Pearl Harbor to hide America's imperial uh, project and to take the focus off of these territories that you know, continental United States is not supposed to really imagine as part of the United oh. States. Oh, yeah, all the expansion that we are already done into the Pacific before then? Yes, and also why those would be important military targets for Japan. So, oh. yeah, so anyway, just to, yeah, there's a lot of interesting stuff about um japan's strategy there yeah that, that's super interesting um how, how do you feel about it was off topic but um you know maybe you know more about this than i do but you know was was pearl harbor something that um maybe i shouldn't ask this question actually <laughs> was it known was it known was it was it something that that created uh an entry point to the war that um I, you know, whether whether the, it was it, it was the, the the door was left open or if it was known and allowed to happen i think are, are two things that's why i was like this is a kind of a touchy thing i don't even know if i should ask this question here but i haven't i haven't studied it enough to know and what i have read i don't even remember uh, <laughs> i know i've come across some commentary on that but i don't even remember what it was it's just the big thing, like you know, the big thing is about like, you know, moving the ships out of you know, the day before the attack, and, oh. and there's all of these cables coming from different areas, and all they were picking up all the communications, which uh, this is all publicly available information now, uh, but there was just so much traffic going on, uh, you know, it wasn't difficult to pick up radio signals, and they didn't have a whole lot of technology to stop that at the time, so. I, I, it's something I would like to learn more about, but it's just super interesting, you know, how much that you know, un, until not to say this word again, God damn it. Uh, but until 9-11, there was nothing like that. There was there was, you know, that was the comparison that people made was Pearl Harbor, uh, which was there's just all these weird things around it. Let's just you know, you leave it at that. Right. But it's just seemed very strange with all of this. 
kind of knowledge that they might have had. Yeah. I, I just have no idea. I don't know. I mean, I'm sure, you know, the intelligence community probably, I don't think it's a monolith. Uh, there's a lot of competing, um, like predictions and models that they produce between yeah. departments. And who knows, maybe one department knew something, another didn't. And there was wishful thinking going on. I mean, there's a lot of things that that's could true. happen. Yep. That, uh, that's true about everything, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Especially that, though. I mean, the way that the intelligence community uh, produces knowledge and then how it's decided what reports are going to be acted on is a conundrum for for uh, chief of command or whatever you want to call the president. <laughs> um, yeah, so I don't know. I mean, I thought I would have a whole lot more to say about 3D printing and guns, and I don't have as much as I thought. No, you're fine, man. You want to check out? I can I can pull the the cam over. You can kind of see what I'm printing. We could. Yeah, check. yeah. Okay. Let's let's finish up on that and make that like the uh, the closing action or whatever. I'm just going to turn my cam off while I walk over there. The cover on. Let's give it one sec. Hopefully it doesn't drop when I unplug my monitor, but we'll see what happens. Oh yeah, there it is. It's a little blurry. Oh wow, that thing is a lot bigger than I thought it would be. Oh, okay. <laughs> so what do you what do you have going right there? So uh, this is exactly what I'm printing right now. I'm just doing a duplicate of this. Uh, this is a Glock 17 uh, Gen 3. Uh, nice. so th this is available. It's free online. Uh, the designer, his name is uh, Chairman Wan. This is a uh, call sign on there. He's on Twitter. Uh, but he does all types of kind of uh, designs around that. I made a couple more. It's kind of hard to see. I can't touch it since we're live. Uh, but you can just see the different uh, grip. It's yeah. What it, each of these. So, so what is the one, material, the plastic? This is just PLA plus. People's okay. plastic. As you can see, this one's a little bit shinier, a little bit smoother, uh, and this one is really made uh, to to grip. This is just the standard design right here, the first one that he came out with, uh, and it's awesome. It works incredibly well. And you fired one before? I just bought all the parts. I just got a parts kit and I'm putting it together. But you can see, like over here, that's that's the handle where it's kind of printing right now, and then. Over on this side, you can see it's empty. Yeah. So that is support. So if we look, you know, kind of over here, you know, we're going to be printing going up this way. That's where we're at right now. We haven't gotten to the trigger yet. So we have to create support areas kind of rising up through here that will eventually attach to the bottom just to, to give it a surface to print on. So actually, I printed out. So here's a, a foregrip that we go on a rifle. So you know your left hand, that's the, you, that, that, that's where you'd be holding the front of the rifle, right there. It just attaches underneath the barrel. Nice. And you can see this one. I left the um, I left the support on. I probably didn't even need it for this, uh, but you see right here that little section. It's just it looks different. Uh, you just pop that off. It's kind of made to detach. So there's only a few connection points in there. Okay, so yeah, it's like when you're using a um, a lathe and you put like uh, use that block uh, a block of wood that's you just screw whatever you're lathing onto it. it exactly, yeah. And and this one, you know, I made this base. You don't have to do that. And and this one too, it, it's printing kind of a base that it attaches to, and that's all going to just pop off. Um, my the bed of my printer, it just had problems with it um, sticking. And so I, it waits a little bit of plastic to go this route, but um, it just 
it just tends to come out. I don't have any problems if I do it this way. So go for it. You know, here's the plastic that's actually feeding into it. Wow. Yeah, this is so much more impressive than the rep wrap was. You'll, you'll have to look that up. It is pretty janky looking. Yeah, so send me the name and I'll, I'll take a look at it. Uh, but it just feeds through this plastic tube and goes into a heating element right here. And then you, you've got this, this gantry, just uh, an X and a Y. And then your Z is that literally this screw in the back that just slowly moves this whole table uh, down as it prints a layer layer by layer until it finishes. So you can see this is the display. I'll wait for it to that maybe be better if I get closer so it corrects the color. So it's backwards. Oh, OK. It's been printing now for 12 hours and 24 minutes. So if it's backwards on the bottom there, uh, you can see it's only 30% done. So. Um, you know, I, I am printing this to actually, you know, possibly use it as a firearm. So um, I want to fill the entire thing with plastic. So, you know, I could change the settings really easily um, to uh, just fill in, you know, 20% or 40% with material. And it could print much, much faster, but it obviously won't be nearly a, as durable. I mean, hands get a little tired. I'm going to come back here. Well, that's a, yeah, that's a rad setup. So yeah, everything from piggy banks to guns. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and... I did try the micrometer that I told you about. I was just, I was having some problems and I, I gave up on that one. Uh, but I mean, there's just all kinds of things you can do with it. Oh yeah. Oh, well, that's cool. Um, you should send me some links so I could put them in the show notes of I know you already sent me the uh, thing. What is it? Thingiverse. Yeah, Thingiverse. Yeah, you just see some different things, and yeah, if you're if you're interested in just just checking out what's possible, um, you know, I, I'll I'll send a couple of links to a couple of different sites um, that just show the massive breadth of things that you can print. Uh, I think it's just so interesting. You know, not just firearms. You know, if that doesn't interest you, I totally understand. You know, that's a personal thing. There are just endless possibilities. I mean, literally, I mean, really, it's, it's just whatever you can design that fits in the space. You can buy uh, whole parts kits that you assemble together to create something. You know, like I mentioned, a micrometer. You have super, super accurate designs with all of the gearing in there, clamps uh, and springs so that you can, uh, you know, measure things down to the fraction of a millimeter with this thing. I mean, it's absolutely incredible. And it, it's completely free. Yeah, I know. One of the main things I would probably want to do with it is create miniatures and board game pieces and things like that. Is yeah. No, I am considering uh, getting a 3D printer set up. So there is some personal research going on in uh, as part. It's of actually it. huge. I, I see a ton of people doing that um, it, because you know you can do like like the Hobbit. Like, hey, like, you know, right. or, hey, Samwise Ganji, I just made him this big. And, you know, like people get, you know, I don't want to say famous, but, you know, a lot of people are download their stuff. And so, you know, people just spend hours making something they really like and put it on the Internet. Or maybe you'll spend, you know, two or three or five dollars on something you really, really want. Uh, but you certainly don't have to. Yeah. No, it's yeah, I'm excited. I'm glad you're doing this. I'm glad it it's uh, affordable now. And yeah, I think uh, this is going to be a real problem for the government for sure. <laughs> no one can stop it. And that's the best thing because you can do literally anything. Well, fuck yes. I'm going to take this and I'm going to clean it up. I'm going to remove all that part of me troubleshooting it. And I'll, <laughs> I'm going to, you know, I'll upload it again with all, all that crap in it. So. Uh, yeah, thank you for coming on the show. I know this was like, got really off to a rough start and everything, but I really appreciate it. No, no. Hey, thanks for having me, man. It's always good to see you. I'm uh, glad we're, uh, glad we're talking more. It's really good to, uh, re reconnect and, and, uh, you've always just had so much knowledge, uh, and you've always, uh, lived your life the way that you wanted to and, and just been free. Um, so I think I've said this to you before, but I've always been very envious of that. So, 
uh, just hope that you always stick to who you are um, and continue to spread that message to more and more people um, because I can honestly say that uh, you personally have had an impact on my life uh, since we were kids uh, because of who you are. So uh, genuinely, I'll, I'll say I'll say thank you. Wow. Well, I don't want to get too verklempt. <laughs> Talk amongst yourselves. Yeah. Well, all right. Um, all right, man. I'll talk to you soon. Thank you, buddy. Yeah, take care. You too.